Lisa, welcome to the show. Very great to be here. Good That's, talking to you, Noel. It's so good. And so today we're going to be talking about the dating manifesto. And it sounds like you're the expert on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the expert on telling other people what to do. Unfortunately, applying it to my own life has been trickier. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, maybe let's just start there because I think that's pretty fascinating in terms of how this came about, you being the, the author of this and the personal journey. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because actually one of the, that was one of the reasons the, the publisher was interested in it because uh, they were like, we have a lot of dating and, um, you know, singleness books from people who are married. <laughs> so how about we actually have one from someone who's still walking that yeah. journey out? And so that's what this is. And um, it really was born out of, um, you know, some bad, a bad season of dating and really feeling like, wow, I don't know what I'm doing. And I thought I did, um, but had received some good counsel and good mentorship uh, into my 30s and then kind of had a turnaround. And since then, um, applied some more of it to my own life. And then every week I get the chance uh, to talk to literally a couple hundred thousand young adults uh, mm. who are out there doing the same thing. So yeah. it makes it kind of kind of fun. Yeah. So I mean, I, I guess I just jump in with this question. What is wrong with dating? What are the problems with dating in our world today? <laughs> yeah, I think part of it is just the frustration that there's not really a script out there. Everyone wants to be told, you know, what's the formula? Of what's my you know, measure for success? How can I do this well? And there's not really a prescriptive way of saying, if you do these four steps, you're going to do it right and it's going to be successful and you'll find your Prince Charming or your, you know, the one. And uh, so folks are kind of left to their own devices. And I think if you look back even, say, um, even a few generations ago, it was, there were a lot more answers. It was kind of like you you graduated from college, maybe served in a war, and then you settled down and started a family. And mm -hmm. now it's like the whole world is open to us. There's so many choices. And by the time you really get serious about dating in a way that might actually lead to marriage and family, um, you are either yourself and or the person you're dating um, hauling in a truckload of baggage, um, <laughs> possibly a lot of bad decisions from the past. And then, um, you know, we've kind of reduced dating to this whole what's in it for me kind of formula where we're looking for something or someone to complete us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got all these crazy algorithms and personality tests and everyone's subjected <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to really being run through the ringer before they're acceptable in that sense. So it can be yeah. frustrating. Yeah. You know, I guess it raises a question in my mind is, um, why get married at all? I mean, I think there's part of this, the, the question of our society today, and you, you've nailed it in terms of just options and there's algorithms and there's, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we're somewhat dealing with the hookup culture where it's a whole lot easier just to stay single and enjoy the benefits of kind of being married, but not really being married. So maybe from your perspective, what's the end goal of dating? I mean, if it's just to do what kind of culture at large is saying you should do, and that is hook up, you know, yeah. use the bennies but not yeah. really commit to it, what would you yeah. say is the, the ultimate goal? Well, and it's interesting because if you look at the culture, you know, you would think that everyone out there just wants to hook up or have one night stands or be in these kind of go nowhere relationships, but that's not true at all. In fact, if you survey young adults across the board, 90% or more um, want marriage in their future. And actually that same percentage believes that they will get there someday. The challenge is this generation of millennials, say, for example, those born in 1980 to 82 or after, um, are the product of the largest divorce generation in history, the boomers. And so they have not seen marriage done well. And so as a result, they're skittish. They're afraid. They're like, well, I want relationship. I want this to last, but I'm not sure I can make it happen. So I'm going to practice it mm -hmm. in the meantime, mm -hmm. um, when really you know, marriage is, is a great thing. It's, it's normative. It's been done in every culture throughout history. And so it's something that kind of innately we feel like this is a good, you know, progression. This is something I want. This is, I want a stable future. I want a family. And so, um, so I think it is one of those things that a lot of people trend towards, but they feel like 
for the here and now, maybe there are other things interrupting them. Maybe it is a fear of marriage. Maybe it's a desire to excel in their career and they think they have to do that first and then tack marriage on in the future. That's kind of where I was. You know, yeah. I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to add marriage at some point, but right now I need to get my education. I need to, um, you know, start my career. I need to get you know, promoted and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I think it really muddies the waters. Yeah. So is that what you're attempting to do in this book is to alleviate the fear of our millennial generation? generation about the, the value of marriage and how do you, I mean, or is it a step-by-step -step guide of here's what you need to do to actually in, end up in a state of marriage? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what, what is the construct of this? <laughs> sure. I loosely uh, tell everyone that this book is everything I wish I'd been told in my 20s, but wasn't. So okay. it's kind of simultaneously an arm around your shoulder and a kick in the pants. Okay. So depends on where you are kind of and what your attitude is. So for that 20 something, it's kind of more the, um, look, if you think marriage is in your future, the time to start thinking about it is now because don't just assume like I did that this is going to be some easy little step that you're going to take when you hit 30. Um, there are a lot of things that are working against you on that front. But then for the person who's more in my space, having trudged through the 20s into the 30s and now, you know, being single when I didn't think I would be at this age and stage, it's kind of an arm around your shoulder to say, you know what? There are a lot of factors that played into this. Some of them are your own fault. <laughs> Some of them are other people's. Some of them are just the, the cultures and what we've inherited. Um, but you can do this and be encouraged and, and really thrive in your life right while you wait. So it's, it's kind of like me talking straight like I do on my show. I'm just like, let's put it out there. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, what everyone knows is going on, but no one wants to act like, you know, take responsibility or whatever and just see where we can go from here. So, so Lisa, let's talk about the elephant. Why are yeah. you not married? <laughs> Well, okay, so I like to tell people I only half joke. I mean, you're say. you're attractive, you're a gifted Aww. writer, you're a successful career. Well, I mean, I, I'm going, what 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 is it that, uh, I, this is very personal, so you don't have to answer it, but I, I thought know, I'd just put the elephant out there. Hey, I totally appreciate that and all. Um, here's the deal. I tell people, jo only half jokingly, I blame my 20s on myself, my 30s on men, and now as I go into my 40s, it just has to be God. I'm going to blame <laughs> Um, no, really, I see and I kind of um, chart this out in the book so people can I, kind of understand. I don't want to come from this place of being like, I know it all. I've done it all well. Let me just tell you exactly what you need to do because that's not the case. Okay. I thought I grew up, my parents were married um, for 50 years before my dad died of cancer. I mean, my parents had a great marriage. I was in churches with people with great marriages. So you would think, I, I like the idea of marriage. You would mm -hmm. think that this would have been easier, as mm -hmm. my mom says. Mm -hmm. My mom's like, Lisa, why is this so hard? You know, t totally different generation. Um, but I believed, I grew up in the California public schools, and my teachers all told me, Lisa, you can be successful. You get out there, you get your education, you start your career, you move along that path, and you do what you need to do. And so I believed them, and I kind of put marriage on the back burner and was like, okay, well, it'll happen. So then I went to school. Uh, and then I emerged from school unmarried, despite going actually to a, a faith-based, a Christian university. So I dropped a lot of cash there with no end result, <laughs> much to my You didn't get the degree. MRS degree, huh? <laughs> I didn't, no. And I was highly assuming, you know, and hoping, but no. Um, so then I got into my 30s. And then as you move into your 30s, um, many single folks can attest to this. You go into churches, you see less people in your age and stage, you see kind of you're more transient because I was moving around the country for my career. Um, I would get settled into kind of a church or whatever only to uproot myself and move on. And so um, you know, as I kind of progressed through that, then you also see, you know, there's less choice. Um, I dated guys. I kind of, I feel like I, I had this wake up call in my thirties and panicked and wanted to make up for lost time. And so mm. then I just started dating and went online mm. and did a bunch of online services. I dated guys who were, um, let's just say, you know, um, losers. Um, <laughs> I'll euphemize it. I'm not going to euphemize it. We won't put um, any names out there. No, no names. <laughs> no, no mention of names. Um, but I will say I dated a guy who um, became a professional clown. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> true story. So all that to say. Uh, but then I think he's back now at his, his original day job. I don't think it worked out for him. But um, 
but yeah, so it was just, it was kind of a free for all and mm. kind of nutty. And mm. so um, I tell, in fact, to your point, when I speak on college campuses, I say, look around you because never will you be with more like-minded headed in the same direction, mm. generally healthy, <laughs> yeah. generally motivated people as you are right now. Yeah. Uh, it does fragment and thin as you get older. But in the midst of all that, Noel, I have to say to myself, look, I can't beat myself up. I can't say, you know, here are the five reasons why I'm still single. Here's what happened. Here's what I did wrong. I have to, you know, as someone who um, who claims my faith as my own and and uh, and is a believer in Jesus Christ, I have to say, you know, God knows what's up. He's got mm-hmm. my back. He's not like wringing his hands, like, what do I do with Lisa? I don't know mm-hmm. what happened mm-hmm. to her. And right. so I have to I have to trust uh, where I am in the story I am in yeah. right now. Well, and I do think there's an element of what you're discussing. Mean, you described that there's some of these uh, milestones that I think as a culture we've established as benchmarks before you can actually say, I do, which is go to school, get a job, buy the house, you know, have the career, da, 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 da. And then let's get married. Right. Mm-hmm. And I right. think you have these delayed starts where, you know, I, I know my wife and I have a number of friends that are 38, 39, unmarried. And they're, you know, they, in their minds, they did it all right. Like they've mm-hmm. done what culture has told us as the right way to, you know, progress through this. Mm-hmm. And now they're looking around saying, and there's, I mean, what's available is I'm looking at the divorcee with three kids mm-hmm. and it's not exactly what I had thought. And not that that's a bad thing. Right. But, right. um, so I guess maybe the question I have is what would you say to that single person right now mm-hmm. who's in their twenties, who maybe has been culturally, indoctrinated into this belief system of you've got to wait, you've got to have all these milestones in order. How would you address them to say, it's not really about those milestones. It's Mm -hmm. more about who you are and the maturity that is maybe lacking right now. And what are the steps that they need to take to be ready for marriage? Yeah. And it's a number of things kind of happening simultaneously, I think. So one is an attitude shift. It's this idea that, you know, marriage is a good thing. I think we need to be talking about it more. I think we need to not act like it's some, um, you know, if you're, if you're single, like, oh my goodness, you know, it's some scourge or what, what's my problem or marriage is kind of like, eh, you know, I think we need to, to elevate it and honor it and Mm -hmm. see it as a good thing. Uh, family as well. Um, all great callings and things you can do in tandem with other things like career. You know, I'll have people tell me, you know, well, my number one thing I really want to do is go build wells in Uganda. And I'm like, that is awesome. Um, but you can actually go there as a as a married couple. You can, you know, there are yeah. very few things in the world that are so dangerous that you really are meant to remain single for that right. purpose. And right. so, why not um, elevate the idea of marriage, see it as a good thing, and and move towards it boldly. Um, that said, I think we also have a problem, and when I speak to boomers, I kind of, um, you know, shame them for this. <laughs> we have a problem with not growing up our young adults soon enough, mm-hmm. and so you see young adults in their 20s who are still maybe living with mom and dad. Maybe they are, um, in fact, I had one mom tell me not too long ago uh, she was filling out her son's college applications, including doing his essays, and I'm like, I don't even think that's morally right. <laughs> um, you know, another mom who whose daughter had rear-ended someone and called up and handed the phone to this guy and let her mom take the fall for her and apologize and work through the details. And so we need a a generation of young adults that are growing up, taking responsibility uh, for their actions, for their decisions, knowing how to um, get a job and keep a job (laughs) to move out on their own. And so to do that track and show that, you know, wow, marriage and family is the next step. It's not going to be some enabling behavior that we're going to hopefully, you know, again, tack it on, but, um, to do it well and to do it intentionally, I think is something, um, that's a great thing. And I say, you know, again, it's, it's like, there's nothing wrong there for generations. People have gotten married in their early twenties. You know, it's a good thing. I'm a big fan actually of young marriage. If you can grow up early enough and get it done. I mean, it's a great uh, opportunity to grow yourself in tandem with someone else. And there's a lot about marriage that will uh, yeah. kind of grow you up sooner rather than later. Yeah. I've always, I, I, I think it's interesting because I think the farming industry probably has the most marriage potential. 
because <laughs> they're <laughs> they're working so. the farm at a young age and they're learning responsibility. You know, some of these mm-hmm. things. I I interviewed a, a guy yesterday, and I, I'm going to steal his line. He said, you know, this. I think the issue with a lot of these boys who never become men, they're they're, they're uninitiated boys yeah. in this, in so many ways. He 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 framed it as they're living their adventure through Xbox and and their romance yeah. through porn. And I yeah. thought, man, isn't that the truth in terms of the delay? of guys really seeing the value of saying, hey, I'm gonna pursue this girl, not to hook up with her, but actually to put a ring on her finger. Yeah, I I say that exact thing in my book. I use that example of how we need guys to join the real stories that are going on in the world today, to um, fight for those who can't fight for themselves, to take ownership of themselves first and then a family, um, to be in big battles in our culture and beyond that are going on rather than play acting at all mm-hmm. these things on the side. Mm-hmm. And the problem is they don't want to risk. They yeah. want the they want the win, but they don't want to risk to get there. And so, and women, yeah, I, I unpack some problems with women as well. <laughs> you know, what, what kind of this. problems do you unpack? Okay. Well, give me some specifics here. (laughs) Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, First for the guys, that was kind of one. The other one is um, I want a, and I'm, you know, my book um, is written largely to a a Christian young adult audience. So I say, I want a supermodel who writes Bible studies. So this idea um, (laughs) that this guy's going to go in on the lowest common denominator with a woman, which is her looks, her attractiveness. And he'll say, you know, okay, I'm only going to date someone who's really hot. And so then when he dates her, then he realizes, okay, for this to go the distance, she's got to have substance too. So then all of a sudden the list um, grows Mm -hmm. and it's, okay, I want her to be teaching Sunday school. I want her to drink fair trade coffee. I want her to play the guitar. I want, (laughs) so she becomes this unattainable ideal. Mm -hmm. Women on the same front, their unattainable ideal is this, um, I'm a princess and I need a prince. So, mm-hmm. and we have been told that I remember sitting in junior high and being told this by a youth pastor and, you know, lady is zero God's princess. Well, that is great, but it doesn't mean that I'm also not supremely screwed up. Okay. <laughs> so, right. and I need to recognize that I'm a, I'm a messed up person that's going to marry someone else messed up. And the only common denominator is that there's grace in the process. So, um, this idea, you know, I've had women straight up tell me, okay, well, you know, I need to marry someone like, and then it's fill in the blank of some like huge Christian leader, like Billy Graham or John Piper or (laughs) Francis Chan. And I'm like, well, that is good. But who is going to marry Justin the plumber? Because maybe he needs to get married too. And (laughs) so it's kind of that ideal. The Mm -hmm. other flip side that women fall for uh, another trap is they want a project to work on. So this is born out of every romantic comedy out there. Um, any plot line from Sex and the City or, you know, you choose the show. Uh, and it is these highly successful women who are going to gather together in some kind of wine bar or yoga class with their girlfriends and talk about these project guys who they're going to work on and fix. And then hopefully they're going to turn into something amazing. They're going to undercover, you know, or or, uh, uncover, oh, actually he's an Ivy League grad and he's working on a novel and he's, and I'm like, no, you know what? I've dated projects and they didn't turn out to be diamonds in the rough. They turned out to be projects. Yeah. And so we need to stop <laughs> acting like we're the saviors of all these men out there and that we're just going to swoop in and take over because um, no guy wants that and no woman wants that leading into marriage. That's for sure. Yeah. You're hitting something because our producer <laughs> of the show, she's single and she's cracking up right now as you're <laughs> describing these scenarios. So yeah. it's uh, obviously true. pretty real. Mm-hmm. Uh so is there any other things that you would say are some of the problems that we see existing, both men and women, in the single dimension mm-hmm. or yeah. single state? Yeah, and I'll, I'll quickly go through. I have an entire chapter in the book um, called Five Reasons Your Love Life is a Disaster or Doesn't Exist. Yes. And they're kind of the five biggest Please defenders. do share. <laughs> <laughs> They're the five biggest offenders that I see. And, and lest I sound like I'm on my high horse, I tell people I'm guilty of all five. Okay. And so uh, at various junctures in my right. life. So, uh, so the first one would be you're waiting for the one. This elusive idea of a soulmate, that there is one person out there in the universe that you would make a great match with. And if you don't find that person, uh, you're pretty much out of luck. And so (laughs) I think Mm. it sets you up for two problems, uh, one of two problems. Either you will never choose, you will be in a constant state of paralysis because what if 
this person isn't the one. You know, you want to put them through the ringer, you want to run them through tests, make sure what does this look like, do you have all the right feelings? Um, you'll just stay single because you, you're not sure. Or you'll rush into a relationship or into marriage and then the minute you hit a bump in the road, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, maybe I didn't choose the one because it should be easier than this. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, um, there are, I say conservatively, hundreds of people in the world that you could build a life with, be attracted to, have kids with, find a, a calling with or a mission with, move ahead with in life and grow old with and do just fine. You need to pick one of those people cut the clutter, put the blinders on, commit to that person, and then that person becomes the one hmm. after that. I think it's a very freeing concept that rather than searching through the reeds, you know, looking <laughs> for someone right. that's going to complete you, you, um, you choose to make that person the one. Um, yeah. And obviously there's a short list, and I have this in the book too, of non-negotiables, you know, sure. what it looks like, what you need to have in place. You know, let's not be marrying felons. Let's not be marrying, you know, yeah. <laughs> let's be realistic here. I'm just glad um, that it's a short list and not a long list. It's a very short <laughs> list. It's a short list. In fact, I talk in the book about um, being encouraged to write a 50-point list uh, back in my school days, you know, yeah. and then to just pray over it and hope that this person, <laughs> if I find that person, never did find them. And so now I'm- I can remember that same four, exercise. Five, now it's crazy. <laughs> totally crazy. So anyway, so that's the first one. The second one, and we talked about this a little bit, you just haven't grown up yet. You're not mm -hmm. in a position to marry. Um, marriage is for adults. It's not for kids. It's not for people who can't even, you know, get their life together or make their own decisions or who can't own their own issues, who can't, uh, who don't know what it's like to ask forgiveness and to forgive others, who don't know what it's like to be teachable and to be malleable, to compromise, to be able to do conflict well, to communicate well. Well, all those are skills that need to be happening regardless of whether you're dating. And so uh, that's a great, <laughs> a great factor to have in place. Exactly. Uh, so that would be the second one. Uh, the third one is um, you are, let me think of the third one. Wow. Where, where am I going with this? <laughs> um, ah, I need to come up with it. Dating? Um, Yes, you are not dating. Yes. So this sounds like super obvious, yeah. um, but the fact is we have a whole generation of people that are just choosing not to date. Maybe they're hanging out in friend groups. Right. Maybe they're kind of like going with their gal pals or guy friends doing things, but they're not dating because they either think, um, hey, I need to uh, you know, have all these boxes checked off before I do, or I need to find out more about this person. What do you need to find out about a person to go to coffee with them? Mm -hmm. It is not a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is not a lot. Um, and so just make it happen. I mean, obviously be safe, you know, be in a public place. Don't be like, you know, right. but if you're set up by a quality friend who's like, this person's legit, give it a chance, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, the, the next one is that you are dating, but your dating is directionless. And that is basically these relationships that have gone on for four, five, six years. They're not, they don't have forward momentum. Mm -hmm. They are hangouts. They are, well, let's have this weird commitment, but not really. Um, it, it's just go nowhere. This is where I hear from the women, especially who are throwing up their hands mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're like, they want a ring on the finger and nothing's happening. Um, yeah. But they're just kind of hanging in there. Uh, which brings me to my last point, and that is you are stuck in a friend relationship. And that is where um, one, you know, uh, two people of the opposite sex become friends, but then one person starts like liking the other person. And like, let's say her name's Ashley, she likes Ben, and they start doing everything together. They're, you know, watching movies together, they're going out to lunch together, he knows her favorite Starbucks drink, um, they're each other's last call of the night, uh, but there's no commitment there. In fact, there's no romantic relationship. But now Ashley is so reeled in that she's going to bide her time and hang out you know, with Ben, hoping it'll turn into something more because she's seen it happen in every 80s romantic comedy that eventually he comes around. And so, um, so she's just going to wait it out. And the fact is, you know, all of a sudden he comes to her and he's like, hey, tell me what you think about Kate, because I'm thinking of asking her out. And then Ashley implodes and yeah. freaks out. Um, I have a friend, actually, who did this for seven years with a guy. Wow. Uh, he never intended to date her, but he was certainly going to use her for companionship and right. emotional security and all this kind of yeah. stuff. And she actually, Noel, had to break up with him after seven years from a non-relationship. 
And it was like a divorce for her, wow. and it took her two years to get over. Wow. And so I just caution people, yeah. don't give up more time, commitment, more physical um, you know, connection, any of that, mm -hmm. unless you have a commitment in place. Yeah, that's so huge. I, Man, I can just see how many people need to hear this message. I'm like running through the names of lists of people <laughs> that need to uh -huh. hear this message. It's so important. So tell us, how, how do you actually date well? Because I think... Part of this, the culture of dating today has moved towards this hookup. Some of the things that you just described, but tell us wh what does dating well look like? Yeah, I, I mean, I like to tell people that the biggest thing to keep in the forefront of your mind is forward motion and intention. And, and to, in order to ensure that, to have accountability in place. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's harder than we think it is, but it's also easier than we think it is. And this is where, you know, like I referenced conversations with my mom, <laughs> you know, it's like, it used to be that you met someone, you took them to a soda shop or some randomness. I mean, my mom met my dad in college, stalked him at a few basketball games, went to a senior banquet and they were married. And it yeah. was like, yep. it stuck, yep. you know, because they decided we're in it to win it. We're committed to each other. We're making this happen. They didn't go through all these like Myers-Briggs and craziness <laughs> to figure out if they're compatible. Okay. So, um, so to date, the first thing you have to do is, you know, obvious again, start dating. Find someone, look in your sphere for people that seem to be relatively on the same page as you are, you know, mm -hmm. so people that are moving in the same direction, people that share the same values. Um, this is why I tell single young adults, I'm like, look, we need to get back to the era of um, having a team of people on our side who are keeping their eyes open for us, because who better to help you find a great match than the people who know and love you best? Right. Um, Yet we've gotten to this point where we're just like, you know, hiding out in our apartments, going online or going to speed dating or using apps, you know, like Tinder and stuff. And it's like ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we think that's going to be as successful as like a legitimate friend who's like, I have this coworker who totally is on the same page as you. And I think you guys should meet. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way. That's mm -hmm. the way to do it, people. Yeah. Not that I'm against online, and we could talk about that too. But sure. but just the point of meeting someone and saying, you know what, you're kind of interesting, and I'd like to do coffee with you. Yeah. You do that, take that step, and then you don't go home, ladies, and start writing your name with this guy's. You don't go picking out china patterns and getting all <laughs> crazy, okay? Because that's what the guy. The guys are going to be like, no, I'm not going to yeah. play that game. Yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> That's scary. Um, That's yeah. actually scary. <laughs> exactly. And then guys, you don't decide like, oh, well, I don't know if I'm into her. I got to do whatever. And then mm -hmm. like go on the fade or don't call her for four weeks. I mean, that's just rude. And let's just have common courtesy and communication skills right. here, yeah. you know, and that's where I talk about intention. You move to that next level. Do you want to go out for a second date? If so ask her again and yeah. do it like either right there or that doesn't mean you're going to marry her. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're going to marry her. If you are not interested and I highly caution people, you know, give it a few dates. I've known too many people that have gotten married, not liking this person on the first date. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Give it a few dates. If after a few dates, you're, this person creeps you out or you were like physically repulsed by them. Okay. Move on. <laughs> it's okay to move on people. Let's not, you know, way over spiritualize something or get crazy. Yeah. Um, move on. Uh, but again, you know, again, move with intention and mm -hmm. be like, you know, decide that once you start dating, you want to do it for real. Mm -hmm. I, I always encourage people don't date seriously until you are in a position to move this thing to marriage. Ultimately, you're going to find yourself in these go nowhere relationships. You're going to set yourself up for a lot of failure and it's mm -hmm. just problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the final question. Uh, okay thinking of the person who has gone through a lot of pain in this area and whether they've they're 20 or they're 40 mm -hmm. and they're potentially, I mean, I think you, you said it, they're angry at God. It's like, you know what? He's let me down. I mean, I, I've tried to do the best navigation of this, but it just hasn't worked out. What would you say to them? Yeah. A few things because I've totally been there. Um, again, you know, I alluded to the fact that I never thought I, I always assumed I would get married. I never thought I'd be be single at this stage in life. And so the first thing I encourage folks to do is to um, be willing to grieve wherever they are with the emotion related to this. I mean, being single is is not 
easy. There mm-hmm. are a lot of awesome rocking things about being single, but um, there are a lot of hard things as well. And mm-hmm. so I encourage uh, folks to go into the Psalms in the Bible. And I love how God there says to pour out our complaint to him. He is the person who wants to hear exactly how we feel and he can handle it. Um, do not pour out your complaint to the guy that you want to date. Um, <laughs> that is where I have seen many women especially go wrong or vent to your friends or get all crazy and catty and start blaming uh, a generation of the opposite sex. You know, that's mm-hmm. not going to help anyone. Mm-hmm. But go to God, pour out your complaint. Be willing to grieve the fact that you don't have the story you thought you would have. And that's okay to be mm-hmm. honest about it and mm-hmm. to find some good folks, especially some mentors um, who can kind of help you walk through where you are and how you're experiencing this. To that point, I tell people too, here's another reason mentors are great. You might need a little mirror there to figure out why dating isn't working out for you. Mm -hmm. Um, All of us have blind spots. All of us need to learn from other folks, especially married folks who have walked that path before us to figure out, you know, is there something off-putting in me? Is there something I need to work on? Is there some attitude, you know, that I'm kind of wrestling with that I need to um, let go of? And so that's a great thing to do as well. Yeah. Um, And then finally, we just have to trust God that he, like I said before, knows our story. He's got our back. He's not flabbergasted by this. Um, he knows exactly what he's doing with us and we can rest in that um, because, you know, we know him and we know that he's ultimately powerful and he's ultimately good. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I've rested and it allows me in each day to look through the little pieces of my story and be like, oh man, here's what's great about today. I mean, boundless.org, what I do for a living, I would probably not be doing were I not single. Yeah. And so yeah. it's just opened up a lot of opportunities uh, for me and a lot of great relationships in the process. Yeah, so good. Well, the book we've been talking about is The Dating Manifesto, and uh, we'll have a link down below the video where you can go and pick this up. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing with us, not only about your book, but your own personal journey through this. Uh, I know this is one that many people Uh, have a lot of questions that struggle and ultimately are looking for hope. And uh, I think that you've offered that today. So thank you for that. Absolutely.